a strange and beautiful land, but in winter, a desert of wind and ice. With such a limited population, Icelanders maintain no armed services. Oh, well, hold up a second. Uh... Is my mic working? Yeah, yeah, you You know what I need now, actually? Uh, can you get me like a glass of Vinto? Vinto? Yeah. <laughs> It'll make you hungry. Well, I'm not gonna drink tea, am I? Thank you very much. This is good. <clears throat> Keep this in. Is that in the shop? Yeah, it's in the shop. <clears throat> This is the DC-117 aircraft. Its story goes way back than just being an abstract plane that has been deserted in Iceland for half a century. It was an American plane that played an enormous role in supplying cargo to key military bases in Europe, from Britain to Helsinki and eventually Iceland. Now it remains on the frozen shores of southern Iceland. This plane is plastered everywhere, from pop culture to like tour guides on Iceland, to even Bollywood and Justin Bieber. And people hundreds of miles away from Iceland, from America, from Brazil, to Germany and Spain and even England, travel just to see this spectacle of history. And it has become renowned as one of the most notorious wreckages in living memory. Just <laughs> take a look at the thing. When you glance at this decaying beast, you get feelings of desertion and loneliness, almost like a liminal space. But nobody ever seems to ask why it's even there in the first place. Everyone just sort of takes it face value. And it also doesn't help that there is absolutely little to no information on why it crashed. And the sheer amount of conflicting accounts of the origins will only leave you more confused. But me, being a historian who loves to question things, I knew that the moment I laid my eyes upon this aircraft, this carcass, this skeleton almost, I knew it was my responsibility to pick apart the pieces of this elaborate puzzle. Not just the puzzle of why this old American plane went missing in the Arctic Circle, but the puzzle of how this tiny island, miles away from anything, would play one of the most crucial and critical roles in 20th century history. So this is what this video series is all about. It's about my findings over the past year of how this plane crashed, from looking at official documents to even speaking with people who flew on this aircraft. And how all of this ties in with one single map drawing of Iceland. A map drawing etched by a US president and has shaped the entire world as we know it today. How and why you may ask, I'm glad you asked. The population of 117,000 people is larger than Ireland and it has a coastline of 1,500 miles. Wait a second guys, wait a second. Okay, we need some context first. What makes Iceland so unique? What makes its geography and landscape so important? Well, for that, I've got some packing to do. Let's go. <laughs> that is boiling hot. Let's go. So this water in here, it isn't artificially hot. This is like natural spring water. Because obviously Iceland has the natural spring. hot springs. Because volcanoes. These banana plants, they're real ones and they're growing in Iceland. Everywhere in Iceland are found amazing hot springs and fantastic pools of bubbling mud. These are a sign of the tremendous heat of the center of the Earth. So, this seemingly small island on the edge of Europe is not only famous for its volcanoes and its hot springs, all from which the locals use for energy and growing plants, but also because it's one of the most volcanic and coldest regions in the world. So cold that nobody's ever considered building a railway. Not even the British, which is absolutely mind-boggling because it's the British, they love those things. So Iceland's size and northern position on the globe makes it perfect for a stepping stone service station from America to Europe, especially since it's positioned midway between the Atlantic and the Eurasian plates. No matter how rural or remote this location is, by 1940, its population of only 150,000 will be dragged into the theatre of war. Wait, 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 guys, guys, guys. We need to take a little bit of a step back, okay? We need to rewind it. 
I have recently returned from a visit to the British troops in Iceland. This will be rent by noise and flame. Sub 1941, a date which will live in infamy. So Iceland's encounter with global war and politics first emerged with the rise of the Third Reich. So Germany, following the outbreak of the Second World War, had just taken almost all of Western Europe, including these two countries, Denmark and Norway. Germany's whole plan of this was to make these into naval bases to attack Britain, but that wasn't all. Germany now had its eyes on Iceland. Sending representatives and slowly enticing Iceland, a neutral country, to accept the invitation to join the Axis forces. And if Germany ever took Iceland, it would enable her to block the supply chain from America to Europe, damaging the Allied war efforts. It could attack British naval fleets in the North Sea, and more dangerously, it could use Iceland to launch an attack on Britain itself, thus changing the entire course of the war. So, enter Churchill, the Prime Minister of Britain. At any rate, that is what we are going to try to do. Whilst watching Iceland slowly slip into the cracks of fascist occupation, he mustered a proposal. He hopped on over to the War Cabinet and went, Yo, guys, we need a flipping base on Iceland right now. And the War Cabinet went, Yeah, yeah, alright, why not? And in theory, Britain would then snatch Iceland before the Germans could do so. So British troops were yeeted over to the western shores of southern Iceland, and I kid you not, these guys planned the invasion while en route with outdated maps. It's just a typical British thing to do. I mean, I'm not really surprised. Well, I mean, there was resistance to the invasion. If you can class resistance as being a local grabbing a soldier's weapon, shoving his cigarette inside of it, then giving it back in his face, then yeah, there was a tiny little bit of resistance. Breathe air! But other than that, the presence of 22,000 British troops went largely unchallenged. The British had successfully and calmly invaded Iceland. And during the war, Britain would set up military bases and landing strips in Iceland to supply Europe with resources and munitions. The foundations for these outposts would eventually evolve to become the naval air station Keflavik, which, 20 years later, would be where our Flying Eagle would be stationed at. However, all throughout World War II, the DC-3, which was sort of more or less the same base model which became the DC-117 aircrafts, was heavily used by the US military in the D-Day landings. From munitions to paratroopers, this aircraft alone had helped the Allied war effort against the Third Reich, with Iceland and Greenland being key service stations. So then the famous DC-3 aircraft, which had been introduced roughly 20 years prior to the war, would soon need modifications because it simply didn't pass transport requirements. And this is when our C-1117D aircraft was eventually introduced. It was meant to be a better version of the DC-3 aircraft and is now stranded in the Arctic Circle. But then this begs many of us to ask, if this plane is an American plane, and it's found, it was found in Iceland in the 1970s. How on earth did the Americans get involved in Iceland? This was a world war, and therefore Britain would have to fight on a series of fronts. One of these fronts being here, in Tunisia. So British troops in Iceland were needed to facilitate these campaigns against the Germans and the Italians. So the British and the Americans engage in secret negotiations to pass the guardianship of Iceland over to their allies across the pond. So President Roosevelt hops on over to Churchill and goes, Hey Churchill, don't worry, I got you my G. We'll send over the mendums. To which Churchill goes, and I quote, We cordially welcome your taking over Iceland. At the earliest possible moment. It's so stupid, it's ridiculous. Why is he why is he making out as if he's coming around for tears? Couldn't he have just gone, yeah, no, you can send troops if you want. But there was a caveat. One, the Americans hadn't joined World War II yet, so it wasn't ready to go occupying a nation outside of its hemisphere. And two, 
Up until this point in history, the Americans were isolationists. Now, what do I mean by the term isolationists? Here. Okay, so, the US since 1823 had this thing here called the Monroe Doctrine. Essentially, it shaped US foreign policy for centuries. Uh, what does this document even entail and how would it obstruct the Americans from occupying Iceland? Well, let's have a look then, shall we? Come on. The Russian Imperial Government the made through the Minister of the Emperor residing here for power or well, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. In the wars of European powers in the matters, we have never taken any part, nor does it comport with our policy to do so. It is only when our rights are invaded or seriously menaced in this hemisphere we are necessarily more attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and okay. Now, this is just a whole lot of 19th century jargon that makes no sense. So let's simplify this a lot more down so we can understand what this document actually is talking about. Right, we're just going to rewind real quick back to the 1800s. And US foreign policy makers were like, yo guys, we are humongous. Among us. We should probably start like invading countries, taking their economic resources, making them slaves, etc, etc. You know, the kind of stuff that colonialists do. And then another guy goes, yeah mate, that sounds like a bright idea. However, let's not get like overboard and let's not go into the eastern hemisphere where those pesky Europeans are. Let's just limit our involvement to the western hemisphere. Like to be honest mate, I ain't, I ain't in the right shape to get involved with those deranged lunatics across the pond. And then the other guy goes, yeah mate, that actually sounds like a better idea. And thus the Monroe Doctrine was born. A document which would make the Americans isolationists. Okay, ad segment. This video is made in partnership with NordVPN. Essentially, if you don't know what NordVPN is, you're living under a rock. NordVPN is the leading brand of VPNs on the market. If you ever want to watch a British TV show, but you're living in silly America, because why would you want to do that? You could essentially use NordVPN, scroll down to United Kingdom, and boom, press it, and your virtual location is now as if it's in England. How cool is that? You can watch all the British TV shows that you want. You can watch Coronation Street. You can watch Fireman Sam. Is Fireman Sam British? You can watch Howard Henry, how cool! Um, and NordVPN is super simple, you don't have to watch like tons of ads to unlock the VP VPN, it's completely just, you just press a button and that's it, it's done. Um, but NordVPN is also a bunch of other things. It's an anti-malware software, it has it built into one of the bundles that you can buy, and also it comes with NordPass. NordPass essentially saves all your passwords on all devices in one place, so if you ever forget your password on your laptop, no problem, NordPass has got you. If you ever forget your password on your phone or your tablet or your computer, NordPass has got you. It saves it on all devices. Um, and also anti-malware, which is built in. Um, so if you ever go onto a website and accidentally like download a bunch of harmful, you know, malicious content, why would you be going on naughty websites anyway? But if you do that, um, the anti-malware software will detect any sort of, you know, viruses and will notify you of it and then will subsequently repel them. So this is how cool NordVPN is. It's not just a VPN but it's a bunch of other things and you can get an amazing deal, an amazing discount using the link in the description below. Um, only using the link in the description below and using the code HARRIST3 as you can see on screen and you can get that juicy juicy deal which you can't get anywhere else um, so please make sure you use the code. Um, and if you don't like what you see you can get your money back 30 days, within 30 days. So that's how sure NordVPN is that you're gonna like the product. Anyway, back onto the documentary. Oh, I got a fresh batch. So, okay, this Monroe Doctrine thing, this sounds cool and all right, but it would be a huge spanner in the works of President Roosevelt. FDR, because you've got to remember, FDR has just made an agreement with the British that they're gonna send American troops to occupy Iceland. Yeah, if we've looked on a map, right, Iceland is not in the Western Hemisphere and therefore it doesn't apply to the Monroe Doctrine. How on earth would uh, Roosevelt justify this, uh, you know, occupation to the public and the Congress? Well, my friends, it was very, very bleak. But first off, let's have a look where Iceland really is on a map. Is it in the we East? <laughs> is Iceland in the West or is it in the Eastern Hemisphere? Let's have a look. Okay, give me a sec. 
I have some big maps to show and prove my point. Oh, there's a mini one. Have a look at this, okay? Where do you think Iceland is? There. It's clearly in the Eastern Hemisphere, okay? Let's go even bigger. Okay, if you couldn't already tell from this map from the 1600s, okay, this map shows that Iceland is in the Eastern Hemisphere, as you can clearly see there. Therefore, not being sufficient enough to be part of the Monroe Doctrine. See, once again, that little splodge there, that's our boy Iceland. If you think that's another uh, anomaly, have a look at this one. Oh, what about this one? Okay, let's have a look at this one. Eastern Hemisphere, this one maybe? No, it's clearly in the Eastern Hemisphere. Let's have a look at another one. That flips the map. There it is, Iceland. And there's not enough Iceland in the Western Hemisphere for it to be classed as being entirely in the Western Hemisphere and therefore America's backyard. Let's have a look at another one. This fellow for the New York Times, this is a, a map codographer. He had clearly shown that, okay, no, Iceland is in the Eastern Hemisphere. So for President Roosevelt to prove that Iceland was actually part of the Western Hemisphere, he needed to invent a myth. He literally grabbed a pen, okay, grabbed an atlas, a geography atlas, and ripped a page out of the atlas which depicted a map of Europe. Okay, he then got his own pen and drew a line and it curves just around Iceland and he goes, here you go guys, Iceland is clearly part of the Western Hemisphere, as you can clearly see in his drawing, which I definitely didn't just draw 13 seconds ago with a crayon, right? So this is the actual photocopy of FDR depiction of what the Monroe Doctrine and what was classed as the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. Bear in mind, this is a random, like, old Joel drawing this line. It's not like he's a cartographer or, like, has speciality in map drawing, okay? This is a president. He has no idea what he's doing, but he clearly uses this to justify everything. I mean, this is a really bad copy of it because this is pretty much the only photocopy that, you know, there is. And I'm pretty sure this is the first time the world is seeing this image, this map, since 1941. Here's a better representation of what the map actually looks like. It uses the same latitude and stuff, so it's exactly how the map describes, right? Just before the line is about to hit Iceland, it conveniently just curves around it, um, which goes against everything that everybody has told Roosevelt. And oh my God, the steps that this guy was willing to take to prove Iceland was in the Western Hemisphere. It's just hilarious. The author actually comments on this and he says that the Congress, the US Congress were like, wait, what? Since when was Iceland in the Western Hemisphere? When they saw the picture of uh, FDL's drawing. And, and everybody was just kind of like, is he for real? Yet, yeah, you know, this map drawing, so childishly drawn, yet yeah, would be the pretext for America's occupation of Iceland. And so as Hitler declared the extension of the war zone to include Iceland, FDR knew it was time. And so American abstinence in the politics of Europe appears to have changed for all time on July 7th, 1941, the day the Americans came to Iceland. And only 900 from Nazi held Norway to this subarctic island during the summer of 1941 came the vanguard of an American expeditionary So you then may ask the question, okay, then how did America's occupation of Iceland change global politics forever? How did it change the world? How did this map help that process? Well, you see, the US had just sent thousands of troops, okay, to an active theater of war outside of its hemisphere whilst the US was still in peacetime. It had not joined the war yet, and this was completely unheard of. And so I like to think of July 7th, 1941 as being America's first shot at being world policemen. I know, you know, they were just occupying a tiny island in the Arctic, but this event broke American isolationism to a point of no return, something which hadn't been broken for centuries, all through the works of this single map drawing. Me personally, I think Iceland was a stepping stone for something much, much more bigger. And, you know, it wasn't a coincidence that the US, only a few months after its occupation of Iceland, they would fully join the Second World War. Something which they would benefit immensely from. Because we have to remember, whenever we think about the US, like, we tend to think about you know, now, you know, its invasion in Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, Korea, etc. 
But it wasn't always like this. The US wasn't always willing to justify and, and invade other countries outside of its hemisphere. At some point though, the line between involvement and non-involvement in the politics of the world had to be permanently crossed. For the US, that line ran right through Iceland. During World War II, Iceland played a crucial role in the battle for freedom. The United States Army is laying better roads. Because if Iceland was crucial to the cause of freedom then, it is even more important today. That's it, that's a wrap, boys. But I'm sure, right, you know, the, uh, the story of this American plane is starting to make a little bit more sense now as we go along. And when we think of the occupation of Iceland, you know, it wasn't just World War II that the US occupied Iceland. In fact, it would occupy it for decades onwards because after World War II, the threat of the Germans in Iceland was gone now. However, there was a new emerging threat in this battle over Iceland. And that threat was from the Soviets. I've been your host, Harris. It's been an honor. This has been good old Vimto. And I shall see you in the next one. Long live. It's a Matisse.